Uh, rich and uh, wonderful days in the Word of God, speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. And as uh, you know, I gave you half of what is on my heart yesterday morning, and we want to complete the remainder this morning. So I would invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, again, a familiar portion of Scripture for us. And we'll jump right in sort of where we left off. As I said last time, perhaps the dominant myth prevailing in evangelicalism is that we must make the gospel acceptable so the perishing will be attracted to it and sort of seduced or lured into the kingdom. And of course, in the process, the true gospel is struggling to survive the hammers and chisels of contemporary Christianity. The efforts to uh, make it inoffensive and uh, acceptable seem to be endless. And the myth is that this will result in more people being converted to Christ, a noble desire, but cannot happen without the presentation of the absolute truth of the gospel. No way to present the true gospel and make it easy to believe. It is hard to believe, and sooner or later the truth must come forward. It alone can save, and therefore, in a sense, all the rest is window dressing. And so we're looking at the shame of the gospel, trying to steel ourselves for the reality of how it is that we must present this glorious gospel. And when we proclaim the word of the cross built into it from a human perspective is shame. Shame. And that's kind of our theme as we're working our way through this uh, portion of 1 Corinthians, uh, the shameful stigma of the cross we talked about yesterday. The fact of crucifixion itself was an immense barrier to belief in the deity, in the Messiahship of the Lord Jesus Christ. The shameful simplicity of the cross that obviates and eliminates and cancels all human wisdom and the shameful singularity of the cross, that is, it is Christ and it is Christ alone, and it is not only Christ and Christ alone, but full submission as much as one understands to His Lordship to the degree that one denies oneself and is willing not only to live for Christ, but if need be to die for Him, and with that attitude follows Christ in submissive obedience from the heart, at least makes the effort to do that willfully. Now let's sort of add some things today, and uh, they won't have equal balance in the time we have because I want to emphasize some more than others, but I do want to mention the shameful sentence of the cross, the shameful sentence of the cross, because I think this is such a powerful point that must be made. In verse 18 again, the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. Just grab that phrase, those who are perishing, those who are ruined, those who are destroyed, those who are on their way to hell. As the old hymn says, God is in the business of rescuing the perishing. And this implies judgment, this implies wrath, this implies punishment as we all know. This makes the cross shameful in the eyes of the world because of the sentence that it reveals. The cross, after all, is to rescue the perishing. How does it do that? Verse 21, Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. It is, again, that substitutionary atonement where the Lord Jesus takes on our guilt is punished by God as if He had committed all the sins of all the people who would ever believe, though in fact He committed no sin ever, yet God treats Him as if He lived our lives so that He may in turn treat us as if we lived His life. You have then implied in the idea of perishing and in the great reality of substitution the obvious reality of man's sinfulness. and so. The sentence that's inherent in the cross is that man is a sinner and he is on the way to eternal judgment. Christ was crucified for sinners. And so as we proclaim the gospel at its very outset, we must address the issue of sin. That must be, in fact, that must be the formidable foundation of all gospel presentation. 
an inescapable indictment of guilt, of damning guilt, of eternally damning guilt that rests upon every human being. Now, obviously, if you're trying to make the gospel palatable, if you're trying to make the gospel popular, this has to be softened significantly, if not eliminated altogether. There is no greater breach of the reality of salvation and the gospel than to minimize sin. But it is hard for the sinner to swallow the fact that he is under such an indictment. Some years ago, I happened to be sitting on an airplane flying to Chicago, from Chicago to Los Angeles. In fact, it was after one of the meetings of the Biblical Council on Inerrancy where we were working on the inerrancy statement. And I was in the airport and uh, the pilot saw me standing there and, and came up and introduced himself to me and said, uh, John, I, I just appreciate your ministry. My children came to Christ in your church and I'm so grateful for the ministry you've had in their lives. And, he said, where are you sitting? I said, well, I'm, you know, in the back of the plane with everybody else. He said, well, come to first class. And uh, after I get this plane up in the air, I'll come back and we'll, we'll talk a little bit. I said, great. So I moved up there and uh, I was working on a project. I was writing a review of Robert Schuller's book, Self-Esteem, The New Reformation. That was my project on the plane. And so I sat down with Robert Schuller's book in my hand, and we took off, and I was, uh, just before we took off, Robert Schuller got on the plane and sat behind me. <laughs> this is true, and I've never said this publicly. He walked by me, looked at me, apparently recognized me, and said, God loves you, and I'm trying. That was quite a greeting, actually. <clears throat> I won't, I won't uh, divulge the whole conversation, but I will tell you that um, I did feel necessary, necessary to tell him what I was going to be doing on the flight and uh, writing a review of his book, um, an amazing thing. Let, let me share some of the things that were in that book. Quotes, it is precisely at this point that classical theology has erred in its insistence that theology be God-centered, not man-centered. Here's another one. This master plan of God is designed around the deepest needs of human beings, self-dignity, self-respect, self-worth, self-esteem. The pearl of great price is genuine self-respect and self-esteem. Here's another one. If we follow God's plan as faithfully as we can, we will feel good about ourselves. Here's another one. God needs you and me to help create a society of self-esteeming people. Here's another one. God's ultimate objective is to turn you and me into self-confident persons. And the last one. Once a person believes he is an unworthy sinner, it is doubtful if he can really honestly accept the saving grace God offers in Jesus Christ. So the greatest barrier to saving grace is to think you're an unworthy sinner. That's not a twist on the gospel. That's absolutely antithetical to everything in the gospel. That's polar opposite. The gospel, frankly, ignores superficialities. It is really totally disinterested in felt needs. It absolutely offers no relief from the struggles of life, in case you're wondering. It doesn't promise any relief. It goes rather to the profound and eternal issue of being saved from eternal punishment by God. If you haven't read Saved From What, you ought to read it and digest it because R.C. has taken us back to the basics. Sinners are saved from the wrath of God because of their sin. 
And these are matters that the dead sinner usually doesn't contemplate. Felt needs preaching is silly, trite, and dangerous. And just to give you an illustration of this, and I like biblical illustrations, as you probably know, turn to Luke 4. To me, this is one of the most fascinating moments in the life of Jesus. And this is one where you could uh, spend a lot of time. I hope if you're a preacher, you'll preach on this passage in Luke chapter 4, verse 16, following. Jesus came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up. Now, he is just beginning his Galilean ministry. He has, prior to this, been baptized about a year before, had some ministry down in Judea, as we well know, where he began his ministry cleaning the temple. And uh, word has spread up the little land of Israel into the Galilee about this amazing person, Jesus Christ. The word has gotten back to his own hometown. He comes back to his own hometown. He comes to the synagogue. It says, as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. He was given the place of the one who reads and explains the Scripture. This must have been an exciting moment in his own hometown. Nazareth was a small sort of off-the-beaten-track town, definitely a, a, a blue-collar town by measurements we might use today, not particularly important, not the center of anything, small enough so that everybody would have known his family. He would have been going back to the synagogue that he went to all his life, to all the people that he had known all his life growing up, all of his uh, family, extended family, friends, neighbors. Everybody in his world, everybody in his life would have been there. This was the Jesus they all had known growing up, the, the perfect child, the perfect young man, uh, the perfect adult before he went off to begin his ministry. They knew him very, very well. He was given the book of the prophet Isaiah, and of course he read from the 61st chapter of Isaiah, a messianic prophecy. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. He read that messianic prophecy that promised the anointed one would come with the Spirit of God on him and that he would preach the good news. Certainly, he exposited that text, but in particular, verse 21 notes, he began to say to them just at the very beginning, today this Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Just absolutely a stunning statement. For centuries, they had been waiting for the Messiah to come. They had been waiting for the fulfillment of this promise. They had been waiting for the Lord's anointed to come and to preach the good news and to bring in the favorable year, the year of redemption. And Jesus simply says, it's now fulfilled. In verse 22, they were all speaking well of Him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from His lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? I mean, they couldn't make the connection because up until he had left, he had not been a teacher. Can you imagine being the incarnate God and not teaching through your adult years until after you were identified by John the Baptist, until after baptism, until the official timing of God to begin the ministry? They weren't used to hearing him say anything. And they had never heard anybody speak this way ever. The clarity of his mind, infinite. The mastery of the language, unparalleled. It was stunning beyond words to hear him speak. And they just couldn't connect it with the man they knew. Well, just to jump sort of to the end, Verse 28, and all in the synagogue were filled with rage as they heard these things, and they rose up and cast him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. 
but passing through their midst, he went his own way. One sermon among the people who knew him and loved him, and they tried to kill him by throwing him off a cliff. This is not seeker-friendly. <laughs> this is inconceivable. How do you do that? By today's measurement, somebody would say, you must be brain dead to go in and so offend an audience that after one sermon, they try to kill you. And these are not irreligious people. These are religious people. And these are not enemies. These are friends. How do you do that? Well, if you look at the middle, you see that uh, he said to them, no doubt, verse 23, you will quote the proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done in Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. Do some tricks, do some signs, do some wonders. The Jews always seeking signs. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. What he's saying is a truism. It's axiomatic. People who know you before you become uh, what Jesus became, of course, in terms of ministry, couldn't make the connection. It was just too much of a connection to make. He, he recognized that they were having a problem. He recognized that they wanted more signs. They were having trouble acknowledging who he was because of familiarity. They willfully rejected the miracles that already had been done as plenty of evidence. They knew they were being done in Capernaum or they wouldn't have said what they said. They wanted more. They wanted signs. And of course, the Lord doesn't do any signs. But in verses 25 to 27, and you'll see how this all comes together, he says, I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. That's one, of the, that's one of the stories in the Old Testament that the Jews like least. That story about Elijah is really a burr to them. There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, many. And there was a famine, but God didn't take food to any Israel widow but to a widow in Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman there. Baal worshipers. Why would God send His Son out of the land of promise and the covenant people into the pagan land of Baal worship to a widow there? Well, you remember the story, and I'm sure you remember it well, 1 Kings 17, that widow there was a penitent widow and a believer in the true God. And so God sent His prophet to her, even though she was a Gentile. She was penitent and she was a true believer, as the story indicates. And then He says in verse 27, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha. The incredible story in 2 Kings of Naaman. None of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian, 2 Kings 5. Naaman was a terrorist. Naaman was a border terrorist who would come across the border who would rape and pillage and kidnap young ladies. And one of the young ladies that he kidnapped out of Israel, of course, is the one that told him about the prophet Elisha. And he came back and eventually came to a place of penitence and was healed of his leprosy. And the message that Jesus is giving them is very simple. God has never been able to do in Israel what He would do because you will not repent, because you will not acknowledge your bankrupt condition. He had to go to find a widow among Baal worshipers. He had to go to find an enemy of Israel, a terrorist, a pagan named Naaman, to find someone with a penitent and believing heart. That's the bottom line. And all of this leads back to what he said in reading Isaiah 61. Look what it says. He sent me 
to preach the gospel, appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the captives, the blind, and the downtrodden. Those are the key ideas. Unless you see yourself as a poor prisoner, blind, and oppressed, if you do not see yourself in that spiritual condition, the gospel doesn't come to you. And those Jews sitting in that synagogue that day were offended at this because they were not the spiritually poor, they were the spiritually rich. They were the devout, faithful synagogue goers. They were the Jews who kept the ceremonies and the Sabbath. They were not poor, they were spiritually rich. They had achieved a certain status by their devotion to the law and the ceremony. They were not prisoners. They were the free. They were the liberated. They were not bound to sin and iniquity. They were not the blind. They were those who could see. And they were not the oppressed. They were not the bearers of guilt. They had been liberated. That's how they viewed themselves, self-righteous. And Jesus is saying to them, the gospel comes to the poor, prisoners, blind, and oppressed those who know they are spiritually bankrupt, that they are prisoners to their sin and to judgment, they are blind to spiritual reality, and they bear an immense and tolerable weight of guilt. That was the message. And he says to them, the gospel comes to those people but with you, it's always been the same. It was the same in Elijah's day, and it was the same in Elisha's day. Your self-righteousness has cut you off from the gospel. In the day of Elijah, he had to go to a widow, a Gentile widow in the land of Baal worshipers. In the time of Elisha, God went and did a miracle for a border terrorist who killed your people and passed by all the widows and all the lepers in Israel. And here it is again. I am here. And the question is, will you recognize that you are the poor, prisoners, blind, and oppressed? You are spiritually bankrupt. You are in prison before an almighty God awaiting execution. You are blind to spiritual reality, and the burden of guilt is massive that oppresses you. And they heard the message, and they tried to throw him off a cliff. And they were his family and friends. This is just a riveting story. How did Jesus do evangelism? This is the shameful sentence of the cross that the sinner hates. These are all barriers to belief. That's why I said it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe. Well, now, it's so hard, the stigma of the cross, the simplicity, the singularity, the sentence of the cross, it's so hard to believe. How is the Lord going to overcome this? Well, maybe the Lord could overcome this if, um, if we could get enough uh, rich and famous and popular and powerful and influential people to be the purveyors of this gospel. And maybe somehow we could uh, ease the, the, the burden of believing this thing if we can get some really wonderfully powerful and adored and beloved and popular people to carry this message. And that leads us to the fourth or fifth point, is it? Fifth point, the shameful society of the cross. Sorry. Go back to 1 Corinthians 1 and meet the shameful society of the cross. Verse 26, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty not many, noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised. God has chosen the things that are not, that He might nullify the things that are, 
Boy, this is just compounding the problem. Not only do we have a message that's hard to believe, but we have it being proclaimed by people who don't matter. Not many wise, Safoy, not many intellectuals, not many dunitas, not many power, power wielders, power people, not many um, eugenes, not many high-born, aristocratic. 178 A.D., Celsus said, the vulgarest and the most uneducated are Christians. There are few, but not many. In fact, verse 27, God has chosen the foolish, the non-intellectuals. God has chosen the weak, the asthene, the powerless, the impotent. God has chosen, in verse 28, the agenes. Base means the people of no birth, the lowborn, without any aristocracy, with, with no heritage of significance, the nobodies. And it keeps going lower. Verse 28, the despised. The... Uh, this is a perfect passive participle, essentially means the people considered as nothing. The non-intellectual, powerless, nobodies who are considered as nothing. Those who are literally despised for their lack of importance. Can it go lower? Yes. Yes. The things that are not, the non-existing ones. Not only are you nobody, you don't even exist. There isn't a more contemptible expression in Greek than this, ta meonta, the nothings. Being somebody was everything. Still is to the perishing. Wouldn't God want to use somebodies? Doesn't He want to use uh, famous people and powerful people? To give his testimony, wouldn't this somehow help us to overcome these terrible, shameful elements of the cross? No, in fact, God has disdained the, the wise and the mighty and the aristocratic, and He's chosen the foolish and the weak and the nobodies and the non-existent ones, and He's done it, please notice, He's done it, verse 27, to shame the wise, and to shame the things that are strong, and to, verse 28, nullify the things that are. To literally cut the skune, to put to shame the wise and the strong, to show that He's not dependent on them, that they are not necessary to His purpose and His plan, to, to cut our geo, to nullify, neutralize, and render absolutely inoperative all human strength and wisdom. Here you have a message that's hard to believe, and if you're dead in trespasses and sins, it's actually impossible to believe. And it's not given to those who somehow can gain our attention and perhaps be more convincing of its truth, but rather it's put in the hands of the nobodies. Why? Verse 29, that no man should boast before God so that God gets all the glory. There will never be any human credit for the salvation of anyone. I need to expand on this a little bit with an illustration. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I'm just sort of introducing these things. Uh, I would like someday to develop these kind of thoughts into something more full. 
But I think this is interesting. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse five. If I signed a book of yours, I may have put uh, under my name Second Corinthians four five to seven because I, I often go back to this passage as a reminder of who I am. We do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. I mean, that verse, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus. We all understand that. But the, the heart of this message, this incredible gospel, is that light shining out of darkness from God, obviously, God who said light shall shine out of darkness in His creative act is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That sort of sums up the whole theme of the week, uh, that the glory of God shines out in the face of Jesus Christ, this glorious Shekinah, this eternal radiance of God, this majestic, inexplicable, incomprehensible majesty of God is the heart and soul of the gospel that we carry. In contrast to that, verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. Again, we find that God wants to glorify Himself. There never should be a human explanation for any effective advance of the gospel. There cannot be a human explanation because we are nothing but earthen vessels. I want to camp on that. The glory of the gospel is indicated in verse 6, light shining out of darkness, the light of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ, this immense concept. And we carry this immensity in clay pots. God has determined to put this glory in a clay pot. That's what an earthen vessel is. And I want to talk about that because I think we might not quite understand it. Ostrakinos is the Greek word. It literally means baked clay, baked clay, dirt baked hard, cheap pots, unrefined, breakable, ugly, replaceable, valueless, like the pot that you keep a plant in that has virtually no value. We are clay pots. I want to talk about what clay pots were used for in ancient days, and I can start by uh, commenting on uh, David Daniel's book on William Tyndale. I've just finished reading that uh, biography of uh, William Tyndale by David Daniel, the Yale professor, and uh, in it there's a section on Thomas More. Thomas More, of course, was uh, a passionate defender of Roman Catholicism who was uh, determined that he was going to do everything he could to stop William Tyndale from putting the Bible into English and getting it into the hands of the people, a terrible crime uh, by the standards of Roman Catholicism at the time. Thomas More not only attacked William Tyndale, but Thomas More also went after Martin Luther. And some of the things that Thomas More wrote about Martin Luther, I couldn't even speak in public. Well, I could, but they would get edited out of the tape. I would, be, I would have to explore a rather rangy scatological vocabulary to deal with the things. For those of you who don't want to know what I'm talking about, there will be a dictionary somewhere and you can look that up. Suffice it to say that he called Luther a privy pot. Does that help? He called Luther a privy pot. And frankly, Luther probably would have agreed based upon 2 Corinthians chapter 4 because that's exactly what an earthen vessel was used for. A privy pot. He said a lot of other horrible things about Luther. But he was a privy pot. This uh, idea is extended in 2 Timothy 2.20, where Paul says, in a large house there are not only gold and silver vessels, but vessels of wood and earthenware, and some are to honor and some to dishonor. 
A house has some vessels, gold, silver vessels, you serve the food on. That's to honor. It has other vessels that you take the result of eating out in dishonor. And that's what the clay pots were used for. The Apostle Paul says, look, we have the glory of God in a privy pot. That's how low it goes. Don't overestimate your importance. The early preachers of the gospel were not the elite intellectuals of Egypt or Greece or Rome or even Israel. The greatest scholars, they tell us, may have been in Egypt. The greatest library was in Alexandria. That perhaps was why. The most distinguished philosophers were in Athens. The powerful were in Rome. The biblical scholars were in Jerusalem, and God disdained all of them for privy pots. I just finished a book, Twelve Ordinary Men, on the apostles. I'm telling you, they were really painfully ordinary men, agonizingly ordinary. Not one was a priest, not one was a scribe, not one was an archon, a ruler of a synagogue, not one was a Pharisee, not one of them had any educational credentials or any power base or any influence or any anything. Up to seven of them may have been fishermen. They worked with their hands. One was a terrorist. One was a tax collector. You know the story. And they were really clay pots. And the Lord passed by Herodotus, the historian, and He passed by Socrates, the thinker, and He passed by Hippocrates, the father of medicine. He passed by Plato, the philosopher, and Aristotle, the wise, and Euclid, the mathematician, and He passed by Archimedes, the father of mechanics, and Hipparchus, the astronomer, and Cicero, the orator, and Virgil, the poet, and everybody else who was somebody. And He started off with twelve ordinary men, and one of them was a wicked, wretched traitor. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse, uh, this is another uh, really helpful passage if you want to see how Paul viewed himself. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, these things I figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sakes that in us you might learn not to exceed what is written in order that no one of you might become arrogant on behalf of one against the other. You know, this idea, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ, uh, I'm of Apollos, this is absolutely distasteful uh, to Paul, and it's obviously an offense to God. Back in chapter 3, verse 5, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? You know, we, we can't have this kind of thing. We're nothing. We're nobody. And we may plant and somebody may water, but it's God who gets the glory. It's God who brings the increase. Verse 7, who regards you as superior, and what do you have that you didn't receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if you didn't receive it? Stop exalting yourselves. And then he gets sarcastic. You are already filled. You have already become rich. You have already become kings without us. Aren't you something? I wish it were true. On the contrary, verse 9, listen to this. I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all, lowest of the low. As far as the public was concerned, they were the lowest of the low. They were all martyred, and John finally was exiled, and Paul had his head chopped off. The lowest of the low, treated like the scum of the world, condemned as men condemned to death. We have become a spectacle to the world. That expresses the image of uh, prisoners in a parade being led down to the arena to die at the hands of gladiators or at the mouths of wild beasts. And then in verse 10, he says, we're fools for Christ's sake, but you are prudent, gets uh, sarcastic again. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are without honor. Just pull it out. Paul says, we're fools, we're weak, we're without honor. In fact, to this present hour, verse 11, we're hungry, we're thirsty, we're poorly clothed, we're roughly treated, we're homeless. 
Yet we toil, working with our own hands. When we're reviled, we bless. When we're persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. And here's the thing I want you to see. We have become as the scum of the world, the dregs of all things even until now. This is the shameful society of the cross. You take the apostles, the best, the first generation of Christ-chosen preachers, and they are scum and dregs. You know what those words mean? Scum is perikatharma. Katharma, catharsis, to cleanse, to clean. Peri, to clean around. It means that which is removed by cleaning thoroughly. We're the, we're the goo that gets cleaned out of the bottom of the pot. Used metaphorically, by the way, for criminals of the lowest class who were sacrificed to deities in the pagan world to pacify angry gods. When they wanted to pacify their angry deity because they were having a plague or lost a war, they would find some scumbag person in their society who meant nothing to anybody, and they would offer him up to the deity, believing that if they eliminated that one element of filth from their society, the god might be pacified. That's used. The term perikatharma was used for such people. Then the second word, dregs, peripsema, means that which comes off by scraping. So Paul goes down even lower. We're not only the goo that you have to clean out, we're the scum and the dregs that you have to scrape off. The last refuge to be scraped off the bottom of the pot. Whew. So the glorious gospel, so hard to believe, is carried by scum, dregs, in the eyes of the world. Now, you know, it seems to me that the Lord made it as hard as it could possibly be made to believe. And you know, at this particular point, you could say, well, it is really a flawed strategy. There certainly must have been a better way. But remember, go back to our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. There's one other point I want to make. No one's salvation depends upon any human. There never will be the salvation of anyone for which a human being can take credit. We're just a clay pot that proclaims the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And it is impossible for us, no matter how clever we are, to empower someone into new life. And there's one more monumental reality I want you to see here. Final point, the shameful sovereignty of the cross. The shameful sovereignty of the cross. How's anybody going to get saved, you say, if we preach a gospel like you're talking about? How's anybody ever going to believe? It's just too hard to believe. Verse 27, but God has, what's the next word? Chosen. Same verse. And God has chosen. Verse 28, God has chosen. Verse 30, I love the NASB translation of this. By His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus became to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption by His doing, by God's doing. Back in verse 18, it says, the cross is the power of God to those who are being saved. Verse 21 says, those who are being saved are those who believe. 
Verse 24 says, those who believe are those who are the called. Verse 27 says, those who are the called are those God has chosen, so that in the end, verse 30, all that Christ is to us, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, is by His doing in Christ Jesus. This is the glorious sovereignty of God. Salvation comes to those who believe because they're called, because they're chosen. That's why verse 29 says that no man should boast before God. And verse 31, that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Taken out of Jeremiah. Why do we want to construct a new gospel when we can't save anybody anyway? But you know, it's so sad. This is a shameful doctrine. Let me read you some things. And I'm going to read you statements from evangelicals. Because this is so sorry to hear and to read. What a sorry situation we have in evangelicalism when things like this are said. Here's a popular evangelical writer, very popular writer, millions of books, to suggest that the merciful, long-suffering, gracious, and loving God of the Bible would invent a dreadful doctrine like election which would have us believe it is an act of grace to select certain people for heaven and by exclusion others for hell comes perilously close to blasphemy. Here's another one from another person. The flawed philosophical theology of pre-selection is an attempt to eliminate man's capacity to exercise his free will, which reduces God's sovereign love to an act of a mere dictator. Here's another one. Calvinism makes our Heavenly Father look like the worst of despots. Here's another one, president of a Christian university. Such is Calvinism, the most unreasonable, incongruous, self-contradictory, man-belittling, and God-dishonoring scheme of theology that ever appeared in Christian thought. No one can accept its contradictory, mutually exclusive propositions without intellectual self-debasement. It holds up a self-centered, selfish, heartless, remorseless tyrant for God and bids us worship Him. Here's a pastor of a Calvary Chapel who wrote, Calvinism makes God a monster who eternally tortures innocent children, removes the hope of consolation from the gospel, limits the atoning work of Christ, resists evangelism, stirs up argumentation, division, promotes a small, angry, judgmental God rather than the large-hearted God of the Bible. See, even people who are within the framework of evangelicalism see the sovereignty of the cross as shameful. Here's another one. To say that God sovereignly chooses who will be saved is the most twisted thing I have ever read. Makes God no better than a pagan idol. Talk about blasphemy. Here's another one from a theological institute. Calvinism makes God a diabolical monster, reduces man who was created in the image of God to a mere robot. All of that comes from commendations of Dave Hunt's book, What Love Is This? Dave Hunt says, Tragically, Calvinism's misrepresentation of God has caused many to turn away from the God of the Bible as from a monster. Listen, folks. If God doesn't determine in His will as the God of the universe to save sinners, nobody would be saved. If God doesn't save the sinner, the sinner is doomed. (laughs) 
the shameful sovereignty of the cross, and yet that's the only hope, the only hope. Not apart from faith, through faith. So what are we left to do? Human pride is destroyed. The gospel assaults our emotions. It collides with our intellect. It crushes our will. It attacks our relationships. It devastates our sense of personal well-being by defining us as perishing sinners under the judgment of God. It is proclaimed by the scum and the dregs There's only one hope, and that is the shameful, sovereign power of God, shameful from a human viewpoint, but all glorious to God, so that no man should ever boast. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Knowing that, how do we minister? Let's hear what Paul said, chapter 2. I'll just read it to you. When I came to you, brethren, I didn't come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God." That's the ministry model. We're not looking for influence in the world. We just look for opportunities to present the true gospel and let God do His glorious work. Father, we thank You for the clarification that Your Word brings to everything, and certainly, of course, to those matters which are related to Your kingdom. We only could desire one thing, knowing the truth, and that is to be faithful to proclaim it, unwaveringly faithful. And behind that proclamation, to live a life that supports what we say. So may we live lives that exalt our Christ as we proclaim His glorious gospel. Clay pots at best, but shining out from us is Your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. And as we faithfully proclaim that, wherever there is good soil, fruit will be born to Your glory. Thank You for this high and holy calling. May we be faithful to it in Your Son's name. Amen.